Good morning, church. Vacation Bible School is among us. Starts tomorrow, but setup starts in about an hour, unless um, Todd goes longer. <laughs> if you are working in Bible school in any capacity, uh, whether you're at helping behind the scenes, or you're a teacher, you're in music, you're making the food, you're in crafts or food, would you please stand if you're helping with Vacation Bible School? Very good. Stay standing because I want to talk to the Lord on your behalf. Let's, let's pray together. Lord, we come before you thanking, thanking you for these volunteers who are standing this morning because they're giving up a week of their time to work in Vacation Bible School. Lord, keep them healthy, keep them strong, give them strength to uh, endure through every day. May the love of Jesus Christ shine through each one of these helpers so when the boys and girls come to Vacation Bible School, they'll see Jesus in these workers. Father, we come before you asking that you would send many children to our Vacation Bible School as we speak about Hero Central, and our hero is, of course, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Lord, if there's any boys and girls who come that do not know him as their Savior, may they find Jesus Christ as their Savior this week. Lord, give us good weather. Give us a time of really meeting needs of children as well. And Lord, I don't know how you're going to use us this week, but may each one of us be the hands and feet of Jesus to the boys and girls who come. So, Lord, we want to give you much praise at the end of this week as we saw, as we will see your spirit working among us and through us and in the midst of all these boys and girls. So bless our Vacation Bible School. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Also, if you haven't signed up your son or daughter for Vacation Bible School or grandson or granddaughter, we have these little pieces of paper out there on the Information Center. They're called our registration. We would like you to pre-register the boys and girls so that Monday, tomorrow, we won't take a lot of time in the registration. They'll already be registered. So you can either do that online or go to the Information Center, which is that half circle out in the hallway outside of the commons. We're privileged today to have with us one of our missionaries from Slovakia because the other missionary is his wife, Jana. But Todd is here. He received his doctorate from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School a number of years ago. He's a professor in the seminary in Slovakia, and he's going to bring us the word of God this morning after first he tells us about how we can pray for him and his work. It looks like someone even ordered my pages for me here. I thought I was going to have to do this first because I left them. I left them. Thank you. I left them out of order after the first time. Um, well, good morning. It's good to be in Davis and worship with you and see, I said this in the first hour, see some familiar faces as it gets uh, further and further away from when uh, we used to attend here regularly, there are fewer and fewer of those familiar faces. Um, but it is good to be in this place that, that is our sending church, the church that, that officially sent us out to Slovakia. And I would like to share a couple of things about our ministry, just a couple of minutes, so that you know how to pray for us. There are some things, um, maybe not everyone gets news about us. We would really love it if you would pray for us, even if it's just maybe this week. We're involved, uh, one thing we're involved in is <clears throat> Narnia Elementary School, and this is a, a ministry that's really exciting for us because Narnia Elementary School was started by our congregation. We have just a little congregation that, that it seems like God is using to, doing, to do big things in Slovakia, and this elementary school is one of them. There are almost 350 students at the school, and about 70% of the students are from uh, non-Christian, unbelieving backgrounds. So it really is a mission field, and we have the opportunity to share the gospel with those kids and their families. And because the school has a really good reputation in our town, uh, it's, it's changing the, the, the reputation of evangelical believers in our town and even further than that. 
So for example, every year there's a, there's a conference, a nationwide conference for educators in Slovakia. And uh, some of the teachers from our school are, are the main speakers at, at a conference like that. And uh, so that's really great. One thing I forgot to mention in the, uh, we'd appreciate your prayer for, for that ministry. Uh, continued prayer as it grows. As we, um, as it grows, there's less and less contact, personal contact that we have uh, between the people from our congregation, the believers, and the, the non-believers from the school. And we really need to, to keep that, that bridge between the school and the congregation so that there's a highway from, from the world into the body of Christ. And we're thinking about ways to do that. And, and one way is to uh, start a counseling ministry. And that's a really new area for Slovakia where it's not even possible to get a Christian counseling degree like you can in the States. And they're looking right now at ways to do that. And, um, and, and so we appreciate your prayer for that. That, I think, is an important next step for us. One thing uh, about the school, this is what I forgot to mention. Uh, uh, Narnia teaches English starting in first grade. And one of the things that sets them apart from other schools is, is that they have, they call them lectors, uh, native speakers of English who are like assistant teachers. You don't have to have a teaching degree, but, um, but uh, just to, to be an assistant teacher working with the kids both during the school day and, and during after school programs. And if you have a, uh, maybe if you're, if you're a student, if you have students taking a gap year out of college, uh, those kind of students, are. it's possible that you could come uh, work for Narnia for a year, where you'd get a bit of a salary, you'd be involved on a great team, and there are lots of other ways outside of Narnia, music ministry, sports ministry, where you can be involved. So I thought I'd let you know about that. Then, of course, I teach at a seminary, appreciate your prayer for that, because we are, every year, have some kind of new existential threat that finances or accreditation or number of students or whatever, and so we, we need your prayers that, that God will continue to sustain that ministry. Because if you think about it, <clears throat> you know, your pastors have shelves and shelves of books that they can pick up and read and help them out with, you know, interpreting a text or what to do in this counseling or, or this church administrative situation. But we just don't have that in Slovakia with, with such a few number of believers. Um, we just don't have all that material translated into the Slovak language. And so it's just a completely different environment where you really have to rely on that theological education aspect to prepare your pastors and your missionaries and your leaders well for ministry. And so pray for that, please. And then uh, there's a church planting movement, I think, in Slovakia, the beginning of one, at least, and appreciate your prayers for that. You might know that from 2001 to 2005, Jana and I were on a church planting team in Slovakia, and that was the first uh, brand new church plant after the fall of commun communism. And just as we were traveling to Slovakia a few weeks ago, that little church plant sent its pastor off to another city to plant a new church. And that's a huge victory for church planting in Slovakia. That, that church had a bit of a crisis at one point, very much of a crisis. And, and that started, there are now four or five church plants in the country, and we really want to see that continue to grow. And we're encouraged to see that the, the, our denomination has, and also our denomination, which is like a, a, an evangelical free, and also the Baptist denomination have really committed to church planting. So we want to see that take off in Slovakia. And I'll play a little bit of a part in that as well as I come alongside and mentor some of these uh, pastors and church planters who don't necessarily have um, a church uh, or theological background. So those three things, Narnia, the seminary, and church planting. If you could pray for those. And also we are short on support, so please pray for that too. <clears throat> All right, let, let me pray for us as we turn to the scriptures now to hear what the Lord has for us today.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you very much that you are a God of compassion, that when we had turned away from you, you came to us, you came into our darkness and brought your word and brought your salvation. And now anyone who believes in you, who believes in what you did when you died and rose again for our sins, anyone who believes in you can be saved. And we can become your children and also your disciples, your followers. And that is a great calling to be your disciple. And this morning as we look at this text from the Gospel of Matthew and see, look a little bit more closely at discipleship and what it means, I do pray that you would, that you would change our hearts, that your Holy Spirit would work in us, convict us, and change us so that we become more like you in discipleship and following after you. And it's because we have confidence in you and that you are working in your church and you are working in us that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The thing about Jesus is that you cannot fit him into your mold. If you try to do that, if you, if you try to, to squeeze Jesus into your expectations or your plan for your life, really all you're doing is setting yourself up for disappointment, maybe even setting yourself up for a crisis in your life. And you can think about an example of someone who did just that. That's the 12 disciples. Because the 12 disciples, they, they were doing the right thing. They were looking for a Messiah. They were expecting God to send the Messiah back. And they were expecting the Messiah <clears throat> to free Israel from Roman oppression. And they were expecting, their idea of Messiah was that the Messiah would come and reign Israel and return her to her glory, the glory from the days of David and Solomon. And so they had left their jobs, they had left their families, and for three years they, they followed Jesus. And these expectations and these plans that they thought were, were really God's plans and expectations, those came crashing down in really just a matter of a few hours when the Roman authorities and the Jewish authorities crucified Christ on a cross, crucified Jesus on a cross, and he died the same death as every other fake Messiah. You can just think of their disillusionment, their despair, their disappointment. The disciples at that point were completely hopeless with no future because everything they thought was their future, all those doors to that were closed and there was no way even back for them. And sometimes we make plans for that in our lives. We make plans, maybe we think that this is the ministry that God wants for us, or this is the job that God wants for me, or this is the life partner that God wants for me. But then all of a sudden, the relationship sours, or I lose the job, or sickness strikes. And in those kinds of situations, with all the doors closed in front of us, we can't just go three steps back and start again. It's hard to do that. Those are really crises situations. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 11. So we'll look at Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 19. And there is a similar situation to what the disciples face, to what we sometimes face. John the Baptist is the person in this case. John the Baptist is in prison preparing a way for the Messiah. But things, <clears throat> as he looks at, at what Jesus is doing, things are not turning out the way he expected them to turn out. And he's beginning to wonder, is Jesus really the one that I was preparing the way for? Did I take a wrong turn somewhere? It just seems that Jesus wasn't matching up with his expectations from Messiah. It's important to point out right now that this question that John has is not just John's question. Because in the Gospel of Matthew, this is the question that Matthew wants us to ask right now. The question is, does Jesus fit 
my expectations of Messiah? Does Jesus fit my expectations of Messiah? Do I truly understand who the Messiah is and what he came to do? And for Matthew, this question is crucial because it leads to another question, another important question for his whole gospel. And that is the question, am I the kind of disciple that I should be? You see, who we think Jesus is and what we think about what he came to do determines what we think it means to be a disciple. If we've got Jesus wrong, we've got discipleship wrong as well. And really, Jesus seldom fits our expectations. He seldom fits into our mold for what we expect from Messiah. Because Jesus is no ordinary Messiah. And no ordinary Messiah means that we need to be no ordinary disciples. So let's take a look at this text in Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 19. I'm going to go ahead and read this text, starting off Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And yet, wisdom is justified by her deeds. We're going to be taking a look at this text in three parts. Verse 1 is a kind of heading for a whole section that comes next. So verse 1 in chapter 11 starts us off on a new section. And we had 8 through 10, chapters 8 through 10 just before this was a section of its own. And 5 through 7 just before that was a section on its own. And now in, in, with this verse, we have a new section. So if we take this uh, verses 1 through 19, we'll divide up into three parts. And the first part will be verses 2 through 6. This is the part where John sends his disciples to Jesus and asks, are you the one who is to come? And we wonder why John is all of a sudden questioning Jesus. Because back in chapter 3, he had no doubt that Jesus is the Messiah. And so when Jesus came to him to be baptized, John even tried to prevent him from being baptized and said, I have need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? 
what's happened between chapter 3, when he was so positive, and now chapter 11, when he seems to be doubting? Well, we have those sections in between that we talked about. And in chapters 5 through 7, Matthew presents Jesus as the new Moses. Like Moses, he brings, Jesus brings God's law down from the mount. And yet, Jesus has an authority that is even greater than the authority of Moses. And it's an authority straight from God. If in 5 through 7 we have the authority of Jesus in his giving of the law, then in chapters 8 through 10 we have the authority of Jesus in his signs and wonders. So Jesus is doing the things we expect the Messiah to do according to the Old Testament prophecy. And so when John sends his disciples to ask Jesus if he truly is the Messiah, Jesus responds to him by pointing to those signs and wonders that he had done in 8 through 10, matching them up with Isaiah's prophecies from chapters like 25 and, and, and 53 and Isaiah 61 and so on. So in chapters 50, 5 through 7, Jesus is like Moses, but with a twist. He's also more than Moses. In chapters 8 through 10, Jesus is like the Jewish expectations of Messiah, but with a twist again. He's more than that. And with just about every miracle that Matthew records, there's a little twist. When Jesus healed the leper in chapter 8, he touched him and he said, Be cleansed. And he was cleansed. Now, according to Jewish purity laws, lepers are unclean. And their uncleanness or their impurity is contagious. It's like if you have one clean hand and one dirty hand and you rub them together, you don't end up with two clean hands. That's absurd. It's crazy. You have two dirty hands. And so it's the same way when Jesus, who was clean, touched the leper who was unclean, except that instead of Jesus becoming unclean, he became clean. The leper became clean. Sure, the Messiah is supposed to cleanse lepers, but by touching them? Is Jesus above God's law that he can touch the unclean and not become unclean himself? Nobody's above the law, right? Or when the storm raged out on the Sea of Galilee, also in chapter 8, it wasn't the storm that awoke Jesus. It was the disciples, and they were all nervous and afraid for their lives. After they woke Jesus up, he simply commanded the storm to be still, and it was. Now, sure, the Messiah is supposed to do signs and wonders, but calm a storm? What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? When they dropped the paralytic down through the roof, Jesus healed him by declaring, your sins are forgiven in Matthew chapter 9. Now, sure, when the Messiah comes, the lame will walk. But does he have authority even to forgive sins? Only God has that kind of authority. So we see that Jesus is the Messiah. He does fulfill all the prophecies of the Old Testament. But he does it with a twist. He does it in surprising ways that catch us off guard and make us wonder, is this really the kind of Messiah that we were expecting. Shouldn't we be looking for someone else? That's why Jesus ends his response to, to John's disciples in verse 6 with, by saying this, Blessed is he who does not take offense with me. In other words, blessed is the one who does not give up on the Messiah or on Jesus as the Messiah when he doesn't match up with their expectations. I guess a favorite verse for people to memorize or to hang up on their bathroom mirror so they see it every day is Jeremiah 29, 11. That text says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's a great verse. <clears throat> 
because God truly is concerned about me. He's concerned about my welfare and my future. On the other hand, though, I can't just reduce that verse to me and my welfare because in, the, in its context, that verse is about God's plan of salvation for all of Israel and even for all the nations. And he's speaking to Israel in a time when they're going to be enduring suffering. We have to be careful not to reduce God's plans just to me and my welfare. In the Chronicles of Narnia, when Lucy found out that she was going to meet Aslan, the lion, the Christ figure, she was afraid. Of course she was afraid. She's going to meet a lion. And so she asked the beaver, the person or the, you know, the animal that's telling her that she's going to meet Aslan, she says, is he safe? And the beaver says, no, of course he's not safe. He's good, but he's not safe. If we expect our Messiah to be safe, our Messiah is too small. The Messiah's plans for you are good, and they are for your welfare, and they are for a hope and a future. But the Messiah's plans for you are not safe. Jesus is no ordinary Messiah. And he's certainly no safe Messiah. Now, before we go on to verses 7 through 15, which will be the second part of, of this section in Matthew's gospel, I think it's interesting to point out that, that in the gospel of Luke, we have a text that looks a little bit like what we see here in verse 5 with Matthew. Verse 5 is where Jesus sends his answer back to John, and he says, you know, you know tell, tell him what you see. The deaf hear, the blind see, the lame walk. <clears throat> and he's referring back to these texts in Isaiah that, that I mentioned. Well, something similar happens in the Gospel of Luke, only Luke records it at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, when Jesus gets up in the synagogue and he reads from one of these texts, from, from Isaiah 61. He reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That's that section that sounds a lot like verse 5, where Matthew, also drawing on Isaiah 61, mentions some of these same wonders that the Messiah will do. And yet, Matthew doesn't mention the part about freeing the captives or setting the oppressed free. And that's interesting, because that's the part that John might be most interested in, since he's in prison, about ready to have his head chopped off by Herod. And it makes you kind of wonder, is that a little bit of a backhand rebuke by Jesus, saying, you know, you've doubted, and so you're not going to get free? Well, this next text is about just that thing. It's about the fact that, no, that is not the case. In fact, it's the opposite. John's suffering, what he is enduring for the Messiah, is the very thing that makes him a model disciple. And after all, Jesus says, starting in verse 7, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? A man dressed in soft clothing? John was neither of those things. John, Jesus said, was a prophet. And not just any prophet, but the greatest prophet ever born to woman. He was the messenger who prepared the way of the Lord. He was even Elijah, who inaugurated the day when the Lord will act on his covenant, the day before the great and awesome day of the Lord. John's resolve in the face of opposition and violence, his embrace of suffering to fulfill the task given to him by the Lord, that is true discipleship. And yet, Jesus says, 
that even the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. In other words, that same kind of discipleship that John exhibited, that the kind that got him in jail, the kind that got him executed by Herod, that is the kind of discipleship that we also, who are part of God's kingdom, are to adopt as well. And now you might be thinking, discipleship, where are you getting the discipleship in this text? And, and here it's helpful to get a little bit of a broader view of how this, the role that this text plays in Matthew overall. So <clears throat> when we look at uh, chapters 8 through 10, that's the part where uh, Matthew records Jesus' signs and wonders, the deeds that he did to demonstrate his messiahship. Well, he records nine different signs and wonders, and he records them in groups of three. So first of all, we have three of Jesus' signs and wonders, and then we have a text about discipleship. Then we have three more of Jesus' signs and wonders, and then text about discipleship. Then the last three of Jesus' deeds, his signs and wonders, and then all of chapter 10 is a text about discipleship. So we see this intertwining of who Jesus is as Messiah and what Jesus expects from us as his disciples. And that's the very thing we have in this text in, in 1 through 19. And this text stands at a new section, we said. It's a section where the opposition to Jesus starts growing and growing and growing. So this idea of what discipleship is Facing opposition plays a role in preparing us for what's to come. And even if you think about the whole book of Matthew, what are the last verses in the Gospel of Matthew? Go ye therefore into all the world, making disciples of all nations. And this idea, making disciples of all nations and being disciples of Christ, this is the big idea, I think, of Matthew. Who Jesus is as Messiah has direct impact on what it means to be and what it is to do the thing of a disciple of Christ. So all of that is kind of converging here in chapter 11 in, in this first section of this new part of the book. John is the perfect example of this kind of disciple. And we should be disciples like John. We should unashamedly proclaim the gospel. When opposition arises, we should stand firm. Like John, we should be devoted to the building of God's kingdom, not our own little safe kingdoms, but God's kingdom and new creation. There are literally hundreds of millions of disciples like this all around the world today. People who remain faithful to the, to the Messiah, even though they themselves are rejected by their families, ostracized by their communities. There are people who have lost their lives, lost their inheritance, their right to marriage, or people who have lost their ability to be employed. We may not experience that same level of persecution, but we are called to that same level, that same kind of discipleship. Not that we look for persecution, but that no matter what, we proclaim the gospel to the lost who are all around us, all over the world. So finally, we come to these last four verses, and these maybe are the most puzzling, but their message is important. These last verses, four verses, are a kind of final rebuke to those who refuse to conform to the Messiah, but want the Messiah to conform to their expectations. I'm going to read that text again, and as we read it, I'm going to try and elaborate it on a little bit so you can see what's going on here. But to what shall I compare this generation? This is six, verse six, starting verse 16. To what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, 
and you did not dance. So we wanted you to be happy, but you wouldn't comply to us. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. The same thing, only the opposite. And it's like, that is like John, who came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. So they expected one thing, but he didn't conform to that idea. And then there's Jesus, who did the opposite. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Neither John nor Jesus, though they're doing exactly the opposite things, are conforming to their expectations. And yet, wisdom, Jesus says, is justified by her deeds. So the first thing we need to realize in this text is that when Jesus says, this generation, he does not mean them, those, then. He means us, here, now. The point is, we are these children. We are these market brats who take their ball and go home if things don't go their way. We all have a tendency to stick with our safe plans whenever Jesus does not fit into our mold of what Messiah should be. And this we cannot do. We cannot refuse to live as disciples because the kind of discipleship that Jesus the Messiah requires doesn't fit our idea of what we think discipleship is. You are not the one who determines what true discipleship is. But true discipleship follows directly from who the Messiah is. To be a true disciple, you must follow the true Messiah. And that ends up looking a lot like John the Baptist. Wisdom, after all, is justified by her deeds. The day I walked down the aisle at the Fundamentalist Baptist Church in Durand to express publicly that I wanted to receive Christ as my Savior, I remember after the service, my family was around me and some other people from the congregation, and I I just kind of heard from somewhere, I think it was the voice of my my grandmother, the voice said, that boy is going to be a missionary. And so here I was, a Christian less than an hour and already confronted with the cost of discipleship. It scared me. It scared me, this idea, that boy is going to be a missionary. Because I was just starting out in high school, and I already had plans for my life. Computers were just coming out. We didn't even have personal computers yet. And I was interested in computers and coding, and I want to go off to the University of Illinois and study computer science. And I even had dreams of starting my own business. I had plans for my life, and my plans did not include going to Africa or Papua New Guinea or wherever to translate the Bible for these tribes off in the sticks. No way. I did not want to follow Christ in that way. But my conversion was sincere. And so all through high school, I can remember praying this prayer. Lord, I want to follow you wherever, wherever you want me to go. And I want to do whatever you want me to do. Just please don't make me be a missionary or a, or a pastor. <laughs> please, not that. Anything but that. And uh, so I prayed that prayer, and I think, I think I'd use that prayer to change me. So when I, when I graduated from the University of Illinois, I was hoping and planning to go on uh, to get a master's degree, but I, but I thought, before I do that, I, I know that in my life, no matter what I'm doing, engineering or whatever, I want to serve the Lord in the, in the local church, and I want to set a pattern for that kind of service. So I decided af- after college to to go on a two-year mission missions trip. So I ended up in Slovakia, and after just six months, the Lord changed my life again. He changed my life even to get me to think about going on a two-year missions trip like that. 
But after only six months in Slovakia, the change was even bigger. Because in Slovakia, I, I realized what those numbers mean that you hear about the number of believers in different countries. In, in Slovakia, 0.2% of the population uh, are made, is made up of evangelical believers. And when you're there, you just have a much greater feel for what that means. So here, <clears throat> just to give you an example, it's still numbers, but a bit of an example. In the United States, according to the statistics, if all of the evangelical believers divvied up all the rest of the population, each of us would have to share the gospel with three or four other people, and then everyone would hear. In Slovakia, and places like Slovakia, if the evangelical believers divvied up all the rest of the population, every believer would have to share the gospel with 499 other people. Okay, so that's, that's you. You, you. I bet you can get your, wrap your head around three or four people, but can you wrap your head around 499 people? It's like an impossible task. And yet that's the task that the Lord has given us, for us to share the gospel with everyone in this generation. That's a big task. So as I, as I was overwhelmed with that, with that call of what discipleship means, I also at the same time saw people who for me were incredible examples of discipleship. I met people who had given up their freedom because they had smuggled Bibles or smuggled Christian literature and then as a result spent time in jail. I met people who had given up their careers or had given up career advancement because of their witness or because they were unwilling to sign a paper that said, I'm not religious, I'm, I, I'm, I do not attend Sunday services, that kind of thing. And when I saw those people, met those people, and saw that need, I, I felt like God was calling me to walk alongside them and help them to take the gospel to the Slovak people. Not everyone will be called to go to Asia or Africa or wherever across the globe, and not everyone will even have to experience physical or psychological suffering for their faith. But I think we all should begin by praying that prayer. Lord, it's hard to follow you. Please help me follow you. Because after all, if our Messiah is no ordinary Messiah, then we should be no ordinary disciples. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you stepped in to time and space, that you came near to us. When we had turned away from you and rejected you, you stepped into darkness and faced physically as a man that rejection. And you faced not only the rejection of your creation, but you, Jesus, faced the rejection of your Father, of God, when you took on our sins in order to remove those sins far away from everyone who would just trust in you. Trust that you are not just any kind of Messiah, but you are God come to earth to pay the price of our sins and release us not from the oppression of the Romans, but from the oppression of sin. You set us free from sin and death. And when you did that actual thing, actually paid the price for our sins by dying and rising again, you also showed us yourself what true discipleship is. And you call us to take up our cross and follow you. To follow you in the face of every kind of opposition. To be willing to go 
wherever you will lead us to go. Sometimes just to be willing to tell our family member or our classmate or our coworker that you love them, that you died for them. Give us that boldness. Give us that courage. Give us also true love for the people around us so that we don't share it in an abrasive way, but so that we share it out of true compassion and love for the people who are lost. And also help us to see that there are more than just the three or four around us, that there are people, hundreds, millions, all over the world who simply don't have that gospel witness, who simply don't have the opportunity to hear unless we go, unless we tell them. Convict us, change our hearts, make us into disciples like you. Because, Lord, it's hard to follow you. Help us learn to follow you. Amen.